Friends and fans agree that Frederick Bean is the finest talking pig of all time. But was he the first? Talking pigs are everywhere these days, but have they always been? When and where did evolution give us the first talking pig? Who was Pig Zero? To answer this question, we must travel far, far back into the mystery of prehistory. Not that far back. That's better. This super old Indonesian cave painting of the local species deer pig highlights the animal's fatness. No doubt there's a human hand behind that. Did these deer pigs talk to their humans? Nobody has yet found any written records from 35,000 years ago, so we may never know. Once humans, or maybe pigs, invented writing, talking pigs entered the historical record. Around the 8th century BCE, the Greek poet Homer portrayed pigginess as a divine curse or punishment, doubtless reflecting long-standing anti-pig attitudes. In an oddity from the Odyssey, the goddess Circe turns Odysseus's sailors into pigs and pens them up. She eventually turns them back into men, which apparently the Greeks considered an improvement. During the 6th century BCE, the Greek slave Aesop wrote his many famous fables, notably The Sheep and the Pig. When the pig is carried off to market, the pitiful porker laments to the sheep, at least the farmer only wants your wool. This fable is likely much older than Aesop, but its message has echoed through the centuries. Pigs get no respect, especially on a pig farm. Consider the fate of the Gadarene swine, a tale of biblical proportions to be taken as gospel truth. In the early first century CE, a herd of swine was just pigging around minding its porky business when Jesus cured a madman by uploading the man's demons into the swine, who promptly charged off a cliff and drowned in the water below. Harsh! And unlike Aesop's pig, the Gadarene swine didn't even get the last word. By the 12th century CE, we find clear evidence of pig-to-person parley. These porky gargoyles still perch atop the Melrose Abbey in the Scottish Borders region. Clearly, they were born to run off at the mouth. But not all porcine persons were so prized. In his Canterbury Tales, 1400 CE, Geoffrey Chaucer promoted a negative view of pig kind that endures to this day. He likened the rude and crude Robin Miller, one of the Canterbury pilgrims, to a boar, complete with dirt, smells, noise, and even nose bristles. Robin Miller himself told the crudest and most memorable of Chaucer's tales, but no actual pigs were invited to speak. Another of the pilgrims, the pardoner, boasts freely of defrauding the gullible by selling fake religious relics notably peddling pig's bones as sacred fragments. Enough about that. Let's turn to another strange medieval fad, pigs playing bagpipes. For some reason, medieval folks enjoyed pictures of animals droning on bagpipes. After all, medieval pictures made no sound. Some scholars scathingly speculate that piping pigs were particularly popular because the pigs in the pipes sounded about the same. These are their scholarly words, not mine. Pig popularity is not peculiar to Western culture. Porkers adorn the landscapes of just about every nation, though we are most familiar with those having long literary traditions. The massive Chinese classic novel, Journey to the West, attributed to author Wu Zhengnen and published around 1598, features among its many supernatural beings Zhu Baji, one-time commander of 80,000 heavenly navy soldiers and part-time Taoist pig god. I apologize to Chinese speakers if my pronunciation turns out to mean get lost or you're ugly, instead of the guy's actual name. In English, he's often called just Pigsy. Anyway, to punish the commander for heavenly misconduct, the Jade Emperor banished him to Earth, where he fell into a pig well and emerged as the pig demon. In some versions of the legend, the pig demon was a man-eating monster. In others, he is simply a trickster, troublemaker, or comic relief. 
He must have talked to humans or they wouldn't have known he was only joking. The bottom line, however, is that Pigsy was not a real pig like Freddy. Real live talking pigs truly took the stage in the 19th century when literacy became more widespread and books cheaper. This was the start of the so-called golden age of children's literature in English. Though of course the folk tales date much further back and come from many sources. The Three Little Pigs first appeared in print in 1840, though I shall not linger over the fate of the first two pigs, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. Joel Chandler Harris, as Uncle Remus, told the story much better in The Story of the Pigs, 1881. For starters, there were five pig siblings, Big Pig, Little Pig, Speckle, Grunt, and Runt, who were all talkers. However, that didn't save the first four from the wolf's fangs. The fifth pig, Runt, emerges victorious by charbroiling the wolf. By the way, Runt is an American and is the smallest and cleverest of the pigs. She is a female, too, but we're closing in on our pig. I suppose I should briefly mention Lewis Carroll's 1865 fantasy mashup, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. In one of its many bizarre scenes, Alice becomes nanny to the Duchess's baby, only to watch it turn into a squealing piglet in her arms. However, unlike everything else in Wonderland, the piglet doesn't talk. Very disappointing. No wonder the author used a pseudonym. In the world of Beatrix Potter, all the animals talked. A lot. Ms. Potter wrote 23 such books between 1902 and 1930, two of which starred pigs. The Tale of Pigling Bland, 1913, and The Tale of Little Pig Robinson, 1930, her last book. Both young pigs left the comforts of family and sty, hit the road, and found adventure, and even romance. They ultimately kept going, passing out of history. Though like all of Ms. Potter's animals, they talked all the way. In fact, Little Pig Robinson demonstrated one of the first recorded signs of pig bilingualism. Robinson, Robinson, called Aunt Dorcas. Come quick, I hear a hen clucking. Fetch me the egg. Don't break it now. Wee, 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 answered Robinson, like a little Frenchman. Which brings us to one of the 20th century's most famous and beloved talking porkers. Piglet, the best friend of Winnie the Pooh, shown in this beautiful watercolor by Ernest H. Shepard himself. The three Pooh books appeared in 1924, 26, and 28, right at the dawn of the Freddy series. The timid piglet mainly worries about things, usually having second thoughts before he has first thoughts. But like Freddy, Piglet is always there when his friends need him. I have often thought that Freddy could have saved himself a lot of trouble if he'd worried more often, like Piglet. The 20th century brought comic books, radio, movies, television, and a veritable evolutionary explosion of talking pig species. The earliest and biggest swine star was Porky Pig, debuting on screen in 1935, three years after the publication of Freddy the Detective, and one year before Freddy and Freginald, later retitled the story of Freginald. Despite his persistent speech difficulties, notably the, 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 that's all folks, Porky led millions of moviegoers through innumerable madcap mishaps and adventures, not retiring until 1965. To his further credit, Porky was even noted in the Journal of Fluency Disorders in 1987 as confidence-building entertainment for stuttering children. But high-tech innovations like movies and broadcasting seem to inspire, not supplant, the written pig-centric word. The Freddy series grew greatly in popularity through the 1940s and 1950s. Indeed, talking pigs moved into many new literary niches and roles. Everyone can agree that the most notorious are the sinister swine Napoleon, Squeaker, Old Major, and Snowball from George Orwell's 1945 classic satire, Animal Farm. While professing freedom for all fauna, they slowly turn the liberated, human-free farm into a brutal, boar-based dictatorship. To this day, we hear the echoes of their malevolent mottos. 
four legs good, two legs bad. And, of course, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Just seven years after Orwell's Political Porkers, that works out to be 1952, Edward B. White introduced readers and young, young and not so young to Some Pig, Wilbur, piggy star of Charlotte's Web. After Animal Farm, folks knew better than to expect only whimsy and humor from talking animal books, and Charlotte's Web addressed serious matters like love and sorrow, life and death. It also illustrated the ups and downs of friendship as well as its enduring value, much as the Freddy books do. Like the Bean Farm, Charlotte's Web features a remarkable rodent, Templeton the Rat. Though Templeton is capable of mischief like the Bean Farm's own Simon, Wilbur the famous pig considers him a friend. And we understand Templeton's feelings quite well. For example, who wouldn't agree when Templeton declares, meetings bore me? Both Animal Farm and Charlotte's Web have been adapted, filmed, portrayed, and dramatized many times since their first publication, and both books have remained continuously in print. Speaking of many long years, what first-generation friend of Freddy can forget the small-screen superstar swine of the 60s, Arnold? Not that Arnold, Arnold Ziffel of Green Acres fame, 1965 through 1971. Arnold is an evolutionary branch on the talking pig family tree. Raised by his human foster parents Fred and Doris Ziffel, he spoke only in piggy grunts but understood and was understood by the English-speaking humans of Hooterville as well as by other animals, notably, notably his canine sweetheart Cynthia, a beautiful basset hound. Arnold usually stole the show. The two-part Green Acres episode a Star Named Arnold is Born, in 1968, was voted TV Guide's 59th best TV episode of all time in 1997. Many 60s comedies appear on that list, but only one starred a pig. And when it comes to showbiz stars, no orating oinker is more highly self-esteemed than Miss Piggy, the flamboyant diva and piggy prima donna who debuted on television in 1974 and on The Muppet Show in 1976. She and her fellow Muppets have appeared in countless TV, movie, print, and digital productions, and in toys both plushy and plastic. But Miss Piggy is also a socially conscious advocate of diversity, making public appearances alongside her amphibious amour, Kermit the Frog. As television and movies grew, talking pigs kept their trotters in the print world. The Sheep Pig, a New Zealand classic, was published in 1983 and pointlessly retitled in the U.S. Babe the Gallant Pig, 1985. Babe is an intrepid talking piglet who is trained to herd sheep by a farmer unfortunately named Arthur H. Hoggett. Befriended by the talking sheepdog couple Fly and Rex and their pups, Babe succeeds famously. Babe and Company later starred in films, 1995 and 97, and an onstage puppet play in 1997. Alas, pejorative porcine profiling reemerged briefly in another pointlessly retitled bestseller, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, U.S. Sorcerer's Stone, don't ask me why, which appeared in 1997 and the movie in 2001. Alas, this story revived the tired theme of pig as punishment that we noted in The Odyssey and Journey to the West. Harry's obnoxious, omnivorous cousin, Dudley Dursley, is given a pig tail by Hagrid the half-giant when he tries to scarf down Harry's 11th birthday cake. Fortunately, this outrage lasted but a moment in the seven-book Harry Potter saga. So who was Pig Zero, the first talking pig? We have followed the history of pontificating porkers from that Indonesian cave painting of 35,000 BCE to the present time. Yet we are no closer to the answer. Through the ages it appears that pigs, be they gods, demons, earthly animals, or drawings on stone, have always been at least as human as we are, and often smarter. But don't worry. Today's pig pen is packed with parleying porcines. 
We have centuries of cultural classics, decades of books, movies, toys, cartoons, and endless adaptations, updates, reimaginings, graphic and digital elaborations. Talking pigs are going strong. But what lies ahead for them? Freddy and his animal friends have already ventured into audiobooks, so you can literally stick him in your ear. I'd like to see our pig move into other new media, for example, graphic novels and animation. Far from eclipsing the Walter Brooks classics, these new incarnations would spark interest in the original books and thus help to keep them in print. Consider this. In his poetic preface addressed to the hesitating purchaser of the classic Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson wondered whether the thoroughly modern readers of 1883 would find a tale of 18th century pirates too old-fashioned. Yet the story is still going strong, even in movies and miniseries, and has spawned shelves and DVDs of new pirate stories. Okay, okay, Miss Piggy insists she was the big attraction in the 1996 movie Muppet Treasure Island. Hence, thence, thus, and therefore, as the Talking Pig universe continues to expand, Freddy's galaxy should go with the flow. Yet while we have our heads in the stars, let's keep our noses in the books. For as Hank the Horse said so memorably in Freddy and the Bean Home News, ain't any harm in reading, longs you don't believe any of it. In conclusion, thank you, Pig Zero, whoever and whenever you were, and whatever you said, you made our own Freddy the Pig possible.